the thing in the cellar by david h keller read by hugh carr directed by brendan james it was a huge cellar entirely out of proportion to the size of the house above it the owner admitted that it was probably built for a distinctly different kind of structure from that which rose above it. Probably the first house had been burned and poverty had caused a diminution of the dwelling erected to take its place. A winding stone stairway connected the cellar with the kitchen. Round the base of this series of steps, successive owners of the house had placed their firewood, winter vegetables, and junk. The junk had gradually been pushed back till it rose head-high in a barricade of uselessness. What was behind that barricade, no one knew, and no one cared. For some hundreds of years, no one had crossed it to penetrate to the black reaches of the cellar behind it. At the top of the steps, separating the kitchen from the cellar, was a stout oaken door. This door was, in a way, as peculiar and out of relation to the rest of the house as the cellar. It was a strange kind of door to find in a modern house and certainly a most unusual door to find on the inside of a house. Thick, stoutly built, dexterously rabbited together with huge wrought iron hinges and a lock that looked as though it came from castle despair. Separating a house from the outside world, such a door would be excusable. Swinging between kitchen and cellar, it seemed peculiarly inappropriate. From the earliest months of his life, Tommy Tucker seemed unhappy in the kitchen, in the front parlor, in the formal dining room, and especially on the first floor of the house, he acted like a normal, healthy child. But carry him to the kitchen, and he began at once to cry. His parents, being plain people, ate in the kitchen save when they had company. Being poor, Mrs. Tucker did most of her work, though occasionally she had a charwoman in to do extra Saturday cleaning, and thus much of her time was spent in the kitchen. And Tommy stayed with her, at least as long as he was unable to walk. Much of the time, he was decidedly unhappy. When Tommy learned to crawl, he lost no time in leaving the kitchen. No sooner was his mother's back turned than the little fellow crawled as fast as he could for the doorway opening into the front of the house, the dining room and the parlor. Once away from the kitchen, he seemed happy. At least he ceased to cry. On being returned to the kitchen, his howls so thoroughly convinced the neighbors that he had colic that more than one bowl of catnip and sage tea was brought to his assistance. It was not until the boy learned to talk that the Tuckers had any idea as to what made him cry so hard when he was in the kitchen. In other words, the baby had to suffer for many months before he obtained at least a little relief. And even when he told his parents what the matter was, they were absolutely unable to comprehend. This is not to be wondered at, because they were both hard-working, rather simple-minded persons. What they finally learned from their little son was this, that if the cellar door was shut, and securely fastened with a heavy iron lock. Tommy could at least eat a meal in peace. If the door was simply closed but not locked, he shivered with fear but kept quiet. 
But if the door was open, if even the slightest streak of black showed that it was not tightly shut, then the little three-year-old would scream himself to the point of exhaustion, especially if his tired father refused him permission to leave the kitchen. Playing in the kitchen, the child developed two interesting habits. Rags, scraps of paper, and splinters of wood were continually being pushed under the thick oaken door to fill the space between the door and the sill. Whenever Mrs. Tucker opened the door, there was always some trash there placed by her son. It annoyed her, and more than once, the little fellow was thrashed for his conduct. But punishment acted in no way as a deterrent. The other habit was as singular. Once the door was closed and locked, he would rather boldly walk up to it and caress the old lock. Even when he was so small that he had to stand on tiptoe to touch it with the tips of his fingers, he would touch it with slow, caressing strokes. Later on, as he grew, he used to kiss it. His father, who only saw the boy at the end of the day, decided that there was no sense in such conduct, and in his masculine way, tried to break the lad of his foolishness. There was, of necessity, no effort on the part of the boy's hard-working parent to understand the psychology behind his son's conduct. All that the man knew was that his little son was acting in a way that was decidedly queer. Tommy loved his mother and was willing to do anything he could to help her in the household tasks. But one thing he would not do, and never did do, and that was to fetch and carry between the house and the cellar. If his mother opened the door, he would run screaming from the room, and he never returned voluntarily till he was assured that the door was closed. He never explained why he acted as he did. In fact, he refused to talk about it, at least to his parents, and that was just as well, because had he done so, they would simply have been more positive than ever that there was something wrong with their only child. They tried, in their own way, to break the child of his unusual habits, failing to change him at all. They decided to ignore his peculiarities. That is, they ignored them until he became six years old, and the time came for him to go to school. He was a sturdy little chap by that time, and more intelligent than the usual boys beginning in the primer class. Mr. Tucker was at times proud of him. The child's attitude towards the cellar door was the one thing that most disturbed his father's pride. Finally, nothing would do but that the Tucker family should call on the local physician. It was an important event in the life of the Tuckers, so important that it demanded the wearing of Sunday clothes and all that sort of thing. The matter is just this, Dr. Hawthorne, said Mr. Tucker in a somewhat embarrassed manner. Our little Tommy is old enough to start school, but he behaves childish in regard to our cellar and the missus and I thought you could tell us what to do about it. It must be his nerves. Ever since he was a baby, continued Mrs. Tucker, taking up the thread of the conversation where her husband had paused, Tommy had a great fear of the cellar. Even now, big boy that he is, he does not love me enough to fetch and carry for me through that door and down those steps. It's not natural for a child to act as he does, and what with the chinking, the cracks of rags, and kissing the lock, it drives me to the point where I fear he may be daft-like when he grows older. The doctor, eager to satisfy new customers and dimly remembering some lectures on the nervous system received when he was a medical student, asked some general questions, listened to the boy's heart, examined his lungs, looked in his eyes, looked at his fingernails. At last, he commented, 
Looks like a healthy boy to me. Yeah, he's sold except the cellar door, said father. Has he ever been sick? Not but fits once or twice when he cried himself blue in the face, answered the mother. Frightened? Perhaps. He was always in the kitchen. Suppose you go out and let me talk to Tommy by myself. And there sat the doctor, very much at his ease, and the little six-year-old boy, very uneasy. Tommy, what is there in the cellar that you're afraid of? I don't know. Have you ever seen it? No, sir. Ever heard it? Smelt it? No, sir. Then how do you know there is something there? Because... Because what? Because there is. That was as far as Tommy would go, and at last his seeming obstinacy annoyed the physician, even as it had for several years annoyed Mr. Tucker. He went to the door and called the parents into the room. He thinks there is something down in the cellar, he stated. The Tuckers simply looked at each other. That's foolish, commented Mr. Tucker. Tis just a plain cellar with junk and firewood and cider barrels in it, added Mrs. Tucker. Since we moved into that house, I've not missed a day without going down those stone steps and I know there's nothing there. But the lad has always screamed when the door was open. I recall that now since he was a child in arms, he was always screaming when the door was open. He thinks there is something down there, said the doctor. That is why we brought you to him, replied the father. It's the child's nerves. Perhaps fatigue or something will calm him. I will tell you what to do, advised the doctor. He thinks there is something there. Just as soon as he finds he is wrong and there is nothing there, he will forget about it. He has been humid too much. What you want to do is open that cellar door and make him stay by himself in the kitchen. Nail the door open so that he cannot close it. Leave him alone there for an hour and then go and laugh at him and show him how silly it was for him to be afraid of an empty cellar. I will give you some nerve and blood tonic and that will help, but the big thing is to show him that there is nothing to be afraid of. On the way back to the Tucker home, Tommy broke away from his parents. They caught him after an exciting chase and kept him between them for the rest of the way home. Once in the house, he disappeared and they found him in the guest room under the bed. The afternoon being already spoiled for Mr. Tucker, he determined to keep the child under observation for the rest of the day. Tommy ate no supper in spite of the urgings of the unhappy mother. The dishes were washed, the evening paper read, the evening pipe smoked, and then and only then did Mr. Tucker take down his toolbox and get out a hammer and some long nails. And I'm going to nail the door open, Tommy, so you cannot close it, as that's what the doctor said, Tommy. You're to be a man and stay here in the kitchen alone for an hour. You'll leave the lamp a burning and then, when you find there's naught to be afraid of, you'll be well and a real man and not something for a man to be ashamed of being the father of. But at the last, Mrs. Tucker kissed Tommy and cried and whispered to her husband not to do it and to wait till the boy was larger. But nothing was to do except to nail the thick door open so that it could not shut and leave the boy there alone with the lamp burning and the dark open space of the doorway to look at with eyes that grew as hot and burning as the flame of the lamp. That same day, Dr. Hawthorne took supper with a classmate of his a man who specialized in psychiatry and who was particularly interested in children. Hawthorne told Johnson about his newest case, the little Tucker boy, and asked him for his opinion. 
Johnson frowned. Children are odd, Hawthorne. Perhaps they're like dogs. It may be their nervous system is more acute than in an adult. We know that our eyesight is limited, us our hearing and smell. I firmly believe there are forms of life which exist in such a form that we can neither see, hear nor smell them. Fondly we delude ourselves into the fallacy of believing that they do not exist because we cannot prove their existence. This Tucker lad may have a nervous system that is particularly acute. He may dimly appreciate the existence of something in the cellar which is unappreciable to his parents. Evidently, there is some basis in the fear of this. Now, I am not saying that there is anything in the cellar. In fact, I suppose that it is just an ordinary cellar. But this boy, since he was a baby, has thought that there was something there. And that is just as bad as though there actually were. What I'd like to know is what makes him think so. Give me the address and I'll call tomorrow and have a talk with the little fellow. What do you think of my advice? Sorry, old man, but I think it was perfectly rotten. If I were you, I would step round there on my way home and prevent them from following it. The little fellow may be badly frightened. You see, he evidently thinks that there's something there. But there isn't. Perhaps not. No doubt he is wrong, but he thinks so. It all worried Dr. Hawthorne so much that he decided to take his friend's advice. It was a cold night, a foggy night, and the physician felt cold as he tramped along the streets. At last, he came to the Tucker house. He remembered now that he had been there once before, long years ago, when little Tommy Tucker came into the world. There was a light in the front window, and in no time at all, Mr. Tucker came to the door. I've come to see Tommy, said the doctor. He's back in the kitchen, replied the father. <laughs> he gave one cry, but since then he's been quiet, sobbed the wife. If I had let her have her way, she would have opened the door. But I said to her, Mother, now is the time to make a man out of Tommy. And I guess he knows by now that there's naught to be afraid of. Well, the hour's up. Suppose we go and let him out and put him to bed. It's been a hard time for the little child, whispered the wife. Carrying the candle, the man walked ahead of the woman and the doctor and at last opened the kitchen door. The room was dark. Lamp has gone out, said the man. Wait till I light it. Tommy! Tommy! called Mrs. Tucker. But the doctor ran to where a white form was stretched on the floor. Sharply, he called for more light. Trembling, he examined all that was left of little Tommy. Twitching, he looked down the open space into the cellar. At last, he turned to Tucker and Tucker's wife. Tommy... Tommy's been hurt, he stammered. I guess he's dead. The mother threw herself on the floor and picked up the torn, mutilated thing that had been only a little while ago, her little Tommy. The man took his hammer and drew out the nails and closed the door and locked it and then drove in long spikes to reinforce the lock. Then he took hold of the doctor's shoulders and shook him. What killed him, doctor? What killed him? He shouted into Hawthorne's ear. The doctor looked at him bravely in spite of the fear in his throat. How do I know, Tucker? He replied, how do I know? Didn't you tell me there was nothing there? Nothing down there in the cellar? Production 
Sound Design and Editing by Brendan James Please support the Black Dog Chronicles by liking this video, sharing on your favorite social media, and subscribing. As always, we thank you for listening. This is Hugh Carr. Is it possible that you are missing out on new editions of the Black Dog Chronicles? <gasps> oh no! Don't despair. Simply remember to click the notification bell next to the subscribe button on our channel. Never miss another edition of the Black Dog Chronicles again.